Hello and welcome to Almost 30 Podcast. Hello everybody, it's Lindsay and Krista, your BFFs in this thing called life. This, Truly. This evolution, this journey that you're on, wherever you are, we are here. We're here to support you. The show was started when we were going through it. In our late 20s, going into our 30s, feeling lost, alone, fearful, doubtful, scared, scared terrified, naked, w- wet, yeah, honestly <laughs> wet, in a corner, <laughs> abandoned on the side of the road. <laughs> it's kind of what it felt like at times, but we found each other and we just started chatting about it on our closet floors with this like janky recorder. And here we are seven years later mm-hmm. with a podcast, a community, um, courses, programs, membership, all the fun things and uh, just honored to support you. Someone asked me the other day at one of our events. So Lindsay and I had full-time jobs for the first two years of building the business. We went on tour. We did everything. We were just doing the most. And I mentioned something about it. She's like, oh, are you still working in the corporate world too? And I'm like, we were at like one of our events. I was like, <laughs> uh, I've been out of it for five years now. <laughs> I was like, do we know each other at all? I know, dude. Sometimes I know sometimes time is so weird. They're like, where are you at? And we're like, Ooh, we're, we're I'm like, I'm doing too much it. and getting little results. That's what I'm doing, okay? <laughs> I'm doing the most and not receiving the, the most in return is pretty much where I'm at. Yeah, it's been quite the journey, but we're really excited. And as with basically most, if not all of our guests, the perfect timing mm-hmm. for today's guest, Miriam Hasna is joining us. This is, this is Miriam week. Mm-hmm. I'm really Two-parter. excited. I'm really honored and grateful. On the way back from Lindsay's wedding on Saturday, I was in an Uber on my way home and I checked my DMs and Lala Delia sent me a voice note and she's like, hey, my friend Miriam wants to do a podcast and yours was one of my favorite um, that I've ever done and I'd love to recommend her. And I said, I am a part of New Earth Mystery School. Mm -hmm. She is technically my teacher. I would really love that. And I've been a fan of Miriam for a long time. You know, she has a beautiful Instagram where she shares so much teaching, but being in part of New Earth Mystery School and then also being a customer of Resonance Apothecary, which is flower essences. I was really, really honored to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. She's not someone that does these very often. So it was really beautiful, especially to have her in studio to sit down and talk about the things that we talk about today on the show and then Thursday on the show that we have coming out. So we have two episodes with Miriam that are really powerful. The first one today is a lot more about energetics, psychic development, um, matching energy, things like that. And then um, the one on Thursday is related to relationships, relationship templates, soul contracts, you know, evolving and devolving more in that realm. So you're going to get a double dose of Miriam, a double dose of us and really, really impactful powerful information that I was just blown away by I know it was it was so nice to just not have um the confines of time because at one point we kind of gave each other the signal like we're gonna keep we're gonna go yes and make this like a whole a whole week of Miriam Hasna and it felt so good to um just meet her where she is too I think oftentimes in interviews sometimes you hear people ask the same questions of people that you know um and it was really refreshing to meet her where she is in her life um and yeah this part one was so fascinating for me I feel like both of us um have come so far and evolved Mm -hmm. so much in in the realm of um our own energetic system and then also sensing others and that energy matching piece I think so many people will be like that's what I've been doing. Oh my goodness. You know, and um, how that's such a beautiful and important coping mechanism for for all of us at some point in our lives. But as adults, it's really important that we um, that we look at that. Yeah, what I love about her work is really looking at the energetics of everything. Mm-hmm. And that just makes everything so clear and so easy to understand. And when we're talking about something like energy matching, which is something that you do for safety or acceptance or love. Um, Oftentimes when we're very young, we're taught that we need to energy match our caretakers, our parents to make essentially them feel comfortable, them feel good, them feel okay. And we learn that as like our default. And so I would notice myself energy matching um, a lot of times in social situations. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd be in social, social situations and see myself almost like taking on the person's energy where I'd be like, whoa, I'm 
embodying this type of character or expression. Mm. And a lot of that is people can bring out sides of you, people can bring out experiences in you, but a lot of that could have been me taking on their energy and just really sort of being not in my true authenticity. Mm -hmm. And so I've had to work on that the past couple of years to like bring my own energy back, to run my own energy, to run my own colors, as Miriam would say, and to really be in my own body and experience and feel okay with Mm -hmm. the tension that exists between two individual beings. And it's interesting because we have very powerful friends. We have really amazing, (laughs) an amazing community. Mm -hmm. And I can tell when I'm in situations with people where they have such good energy, hygiene and maintenance and boundaries that I cannot energy match. Yeah. And I cannot be at a place where we're sort of running the same energy. And it's really interesting because I can like feel it happen where I'm like, whoa, this is crazy because we have to stay in our own energies because that's really how you want to be when you're in your deepest authenticity. Yes. Yeah, it's been it's been such a teacher for me in like very intimate relationships, whether it's like with you or with Sean or with my family. Yeah, I I would certainly energy match because I felt I don't know even what it was. I don't know if I needed to match in order to be loved or validated. It was more so I just took it on. Yeah. You know what I mean? You just kind of like yeah. you're like now we are going to be like this. Well, it's unconscious. That's yes, what's so crazy. Yes, yes, exactly. So um, it's been such a, a cool thing to understand what's happening. And then like Krista said, kind of pull your energy back. Um, and so she really goes into how we do that. Anyone can do this, uh, but it was quite profound. Yeah. So in this episode, you'll learn a lot about energetics. You'll learn a lot about authenticity, how to shift your energy. You will learn a lot about um, matching energy and hooking and all of these really powerful concepts that will Mm. truly change your life if you apply them. So you can find Mariam Hasna on Instagram, Mariam Hasna, it's M-A-R-Y-A-M-H-A-S-N-A-A. And then you can also find her at New Earth Mystery School. So on her website, MariamHasna.com is New Earth Mystery School, is Resonance Apothecary and her events. She's going to be doing a lot more in the next year. And I am a fan of her work. I'm mm-hmm. a consumer of her work. I'm a, like a wallflower in the group, but I find it to be really helpful. Yeah. So stay tuned for part two coming Thursday. Make sure you're subscribed to Almost 30 so it hits your little pod inbox. Thank you for being a part of our community. We appreciate you. And if you're just getting to know the Almost 30 sphere, please go to almost30.com. We have a membership. Uh, We also have courses and programs like the Life Edit, Krista's Signature Program, and my program, The Sacredness of Being Single, as well as programs for podcasters. We love uh, teaching podcasters because we've we've done it all. We've we've Mm -hmm. built this from the ground up. And so we're happy to support you in your process. Again, that's almost30.com. We love you guys. We'll see you soon. So I wish I was someone that cooked at home. I wish I was someone that had all the ingredients, that had all the time, that had this beautiful kitchen that I could just live and love and laugh in my whole life. But that is not me. So I rely on Daily Harvest to get me through my week, through my day with really, really amazing fruit and vegetable based, low maintenance, really good for you, built on organic ingredients items that live in my freezer that I eat all freaking week. I eat the smoothies in the mornings. I have the lattes sometimes. They have these really, really amazing harvest bowls that I'll have as a snack or like an early lunch. And then I'll have a pesto flatbread, like one of their flatbreads in the afternoon and maybe a forager bowl for dinner. And then of course the ice cream. My favorite is the mint cacao smoothie. I'll add protein to that. So it's like a fiber rich greens based protein rich smoothie that gets me through my morning. And then I really, really love the Harvest Bowl. My favorite is the sweet potato and wild rice hash. It has around 300 calories, so it feels like a really, really good snack or like a part of a meal. And then I'll have the flatbreads. These are like between 300 and 400 calories, and they're just incredible. It is all veggies. It feels super exciting. It's like crunchy and thin and just amazing. I am obsessed with these. I'll pop these in the oven for 20 minutes and feel so satisfied by the pizza moment that I'm having. That's all veggies. And then the forager bowls. These forager bowls are really, really good. They're sweet and savory. You can kind of build on them. I really, really love the apple cinnamon oat bowl. I'll throw protein in this as well. So it has fiber, it has protein, and it really, really sets me up for an amazing morning. 
I love Daily Harvest. I love that it's organic. I love that it makes eating fruit and vegetables super easy. I love that the nutrients are in there because it's flash frozen. And it just makes my life really, really good because I can eat really well in a way that fits my schedule. Highly recommend Daily Harvest for all of your food needs. So what you can do to get $40 off your first box, which is so major, is go to dailyharvest.com slash almost 30. dailyharvest.com slash almost 30 and get $40 off your box and DM me what you loved. So your girl did a photo shoot this weekend. She's redoing her website. She's stepping out. She's loving life and trying to express it through art and creativity. And when I was sharing some of the photos from my photo shoot, I got a lot of DMs about my hair supplements. So I'm a girl that loves a long, thick mane. I want my hair to feel vital and shiny and just really be a part of my beauty experience in life. And people were asking, what are the supplements that I take for my hair? And the number one thing that I've taken for years is Nutrafol. So Nutrafol is basically the number one dermatologist recommended hair growth supplement. It's clinically proven to improve your hair growth, thickness, and visible scalp coverage. I was someone that started taking it a few years ago when I noticed that some hormone changes in my life had affected my hair. and It was looking thin and looking dull. And ever since, I've noticed longer, stronger, thicker hair. There's a lot of people that experience thinning hair. It's really common, it's normal, and it's nothing to be ashamed about. So Nutrafol is gonna be really, really helpful to improve your hair growth after a few months. So Nutrafol supports healthy hair growth from within by targeting the five root causes of thinning, stress, hormones, environment, nutrition, and metabolism through whole body health. So what I love about Nutrafol too is that by supporting these different processes in the body, such as your metabolism and nutrition, It also helps your body be more vital and feel good anyways, and the hair growth is just a positive effect of that. You can grow longer, thicker, and healthier hair and support the show at Nutrafol.com and use code ALMOST30. That's Nutrafol.com and use promo code ALMOST30, support our show, and get $15 off for the hair of your dreams. I was thinking about that, like the journey of spirituality, where it's like all the things, all the kind of surface level things and then there's conspiracy time and then yeah, there's like simplicity and i love i love talking to i was kind of a teenager i love talking to him about conspiracy theories oh, it's oh fun he has like really cool things to say and thinks about them and all that kind of stuff and yeah that um, generation too what what is his perspective is like more, like he has more information or what is like what's his vibe with it oh he has he has a lot of information but he's like i asked him i was like why do you think conspiracy theorists are so stuck like, you know, and yeah. he's like, well, he's like, he said that he, like his take on it is that like they have a very specific message that they need to get out and they can't like get off of it until, until like, people get it. Oh. Wow. And that's I was like, so you're so profound. right. Yeah. It really is true. And that's like the thing for me. I'm like, at some point I was like, this sounds like, this feels like a broken record. A hundred. Yeah. I feel like a broken record and it's time to get on a different note. Yeah. I just was like oh, how am I participating because I'm finding an another, like an other. Yeah. Like I'm finding the other of people that aren't awake, people that don't know. How am I, and energetically, how am I contributing to the same energy that I'm trying to step away from? I think it's actually a really important question because I feel like that speaks to, like having that question around what is my energy actually contributing to, right? Mm-hmm. Like, in focusing on this thing, am I actually giving it life or am I giving it life by not focusing on it because I'm in denial about mm-hmm. it, right? Like, it's really subtle. Um, and I think that for me, I understand I understand how to track my energy. Mm-hmm. And when I'm like, okay, now I'm at the point where I'm matching mm-hmm. energy with the problem. But I don't think a lot of people know that. So I think a lot of people have these very oversimplified concepts of like, if you focus on this thing, you're going to manifest more of it, right? And it's like, it's way more nuanced Mm. than that. You have the ability to be neutral while you're observing things and to not contribute energetically, giving it creative energy, Mm. you know? So for me, I think that we can be, um, you know, engaging with the problems Mm -hmm. of the world in a lot of different ways, but it's not clear cut and dry that like, Focusing on them is always the problem or not focusing on them. It's really about your energy when you engage with them. Can we talk about like the nuance of how that feels? Because I can kind of like tap into moments where I felt like I'm definitely creating or like a part of it. Yeah. So um, 
one of the things that like I always talk about is matching energy, right? I have like a tweet that you know people love. I always say matching energy is a trauma response, right? Mm-hmm. And that's an oversimplified tweet, but like in a lot of ways, um, when we interact with someone and we immediately like match what their energy is, or we're looking at a problem and we match the energy of the problem. Yeah. You know, that to me in energy work, that's like a fundamental concept to recognize how am I showing up? Am I showing up authentically in relationship with this thing? Can I contribute something to it? Can I create an energy shift with it? Of course, I have to observe the problem, right, to enough to analyze it, to recognize, okay, I don't want to create that. Mm -hmm. So we learn through opposites, right? Mm -hmm. Like we were in this polarity reality and we do learn through like, okay, like that was, that's what it feels like when someone's not kind. That's what it feels like when someone is not compassionate. That's what it feels like when someone is judging me. So we have that reference point. And when we allow the things that have happened to us to become how we respond to life, that's not authenticity, you know, because all we're doing is we're creating strategies based on what other people have done and what we have seen and by matching that energy. Clip it. <laughs> Clip it. <laughs> in, you know, in, in, in my school, when we actually go in and we do energy work, because, you know, some of the pushback I get from people all the time is, well, well, you do want to match, like, good energy, mm. right? Like, okay, you don't want to match. If someone's angry, right, or someone is against you or someone dislikes you or they're frustrated with you and they're misunderstanding you for whatever reason and they're coming at you with that energy, right? They're like, of course, I don't want to match them because then I become like them, right? And then it's just like equal force Mm -hmm. against each other. So what we talk about is like becoming neutral, right? Being in flow. That means like whatever is, whatever energy is coming at you, you're engaging with it, you're in relationship with it, but it's not going to hook you yeah. because you're not giving your power away to it. Instead, you're allowing what's coming at you to inform how you show up. And it's, I'm, I'm explaining it in this way where it's like, it's really simple, but it takes practice. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, it takes practice to be able to feel, you know, someone is overstepping my boundaries. Someone mm-hmm. like, and to say, that's what's happening. To not pretend oh no i'm just gonna just gonna be compassionate no first you have to see what's happening you know first you have to really show up and and acknowledge and um just recognize like this this is happening right when you have a natural resistance to like something that's coming at you how we do the energy work is we clear our resistance because Mm -hmm. a lot of times our resistance is they shouldn't be able to do that that shouldn't be happening That person shouldn't, I didn't do anything to them. So we immediately match that force against what they're coming at us with, Mm -hmm. right? And the way that a lot of other people do it is that they become like, they collapse. Mm -hmm. You know, they shrink. They go like really docile, you know? And that's not what we're talking about when we talk about neutrality, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? So I'm talking about all these sort of like kind of subtle body states, that we train when we do like psychic development Mm -hmm. so that you can see like literally you can either see perceive feel know this is what's coming at me how do i like run my energy in that moment that i'm not afraid like i'm not going Mm -hmm. into fear i'm not going into i need to change your mind i'm not going into resistance i'm you know all the things that we can do where we end up being in a conflict with something because we're not sure how to engage, Mm -hmm. right? Instead, we can, you know, find our own authentic response when we allow ourselves to like be in that dynamic play of all the things that are happening. So you said, you know, how do you become aware of it? You know, to me, it's really um, being willing to feel what things feel like. Mm -hmm. You know, being willing to feel what things feel like and being willing to authentically feel what's coming up in you. So then you can again, and I'm taking like a moment in time where if we were to slow it down and look at all the moving parts, right, what what could be coming up in me in that moment is frustration, right, of not feeling seen, of not feeling heard, of maybe the tendency to want to over explain myself, right, to want to like 
like what they just knew more had more mm-hmm. information they would understand my point of view but i also have to be able to see where they're at i have to see how much space yeah. they have to actually hear and receive what i might want to share so if in that moment i recognize they don't have any space they're not actually interested in conversation. Mm-hmm. They have no space for new information. Whereas so I'm quickly reading the situation, and again, I'm slowing it down in time mm-hmm. because it, but it happens quickly. But I'm I'm seeing everything that's playing out, and from there, who do I want to be in that moment? Mm-hmm. What are my options? What's <laughs> available? And when 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 I collapse, I don't have a lot of options, mm-hmm. right? So. I have to be able, and the way you do it is in all of your energy centers. You do it in your aura. You do it in your subtle body. If I notice, like, they threw energy at me to basically let, you know, that they're angry at me, and my third energy center collapse, now I'm not in my power, right? So I have to, like, breathe back Mm -hmm. into that space, reground, make sure I'm grounded, make sure I'm connected to the earth, that I, like, the safety is coming from the earth, right? Right. I get to be who I am, right? And and all of that energy comes in to support me just to say, I'm still here. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't need your validation. I don't need you to agree with me. I don't need to prove anything. On the outside, you know, it you might not see all of that, but what's happening in your aura and in your energy field is something that, like, is authentically you, yeah. you know? And, and in that moment... You know, instead of maybe autom- like this automatically, the right thing to do is to have compassion. Maybe they can't receive compassion, so there would there would be no reason to um, to direct compassion at them when they they don't have space for it. But you could run compassion for yourself. You say this is difficult. Right? I'm bringing in compassion, but I'm I'm resourcing myself. Mm-hmm. I'm nourishing myself because this is challenging, yeah. right? So you would run your energy in a way that is specific to the moment. So it would be specific to the problem, whatever like the problem mm-hmm. is. And you would use your skills, your tools to decide what would the most optimal energy that I can bring in this moment to shift my choices, to shift my timeline, regardless of what the other person's doing. Right. We have the opportunity to use every moment to teach us something about ourselves, to step into greater mastery of ourselves. Right. And to get to witness ourselves like, wow, that was really cool. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's not about again, it's not about anyone else. They didn't see it or, you know, whatever, because it's subtle. But what people do recognize is that they feel something different. Yes. Right. They feel like, I don't know what it is, but I can't get to them or they're not hooked. And eventually what I realize is that people that are out to sort of like play people, that's what they really do. Like they Mm -hmm. they pull your strings. Right. Mm -hmm. And they play you like an instrument because they're like, oh, I see they have these heart strings and Mm -hmm. I'm just going to play them like an Mm -hmm. instrument. When they realize that they can't do that, people start to leave you alone. It's like a system, it like re-situates everyone in the system. Yeah, Yeah. Mm -hmm. people are kind of like, okay, let me find another person to Mm. kind of like troll or harass Mm -hmm. or, you know, because the gig is up. Yeah. You know, it's no, it's no fun. Mm -hmm. Because you're like, I'm not, I'm not going to be reactive to what you're throwing at me. I'm not, I'm also not going to like love and let you to death, right? It's not about that. Um, and they're and so they like they can't perceive what you're doing, but they're like, hmm, something's something's happening here, and I don't like it. But then they just go away. Yeah, yeah, you know. So your girl just got back from Hawaii. I was with all my friends, and when we landed, we all rolled up in our away luggages, and we were just cruising, feeling good, looking good, and loving life. We actually talked about how much we love our away luggage. We brought the carry-on because we didn't have that much. And the lightweight carry-on is just amazing. It's built to last. It's durable. It has a hard shell. And it's compact enough for the plane or any trip. I swear by it. It's the thing that I get as a gift for people in my life because I think away luggage is so sexy and cool and easy. And for longer trips, I will do the large. I have two larges. And these will be for when I go abroad. And it's something that is really easy to travel with. I don't have to worry about it because it can stand pretty much any journey, but also is super light. 
And I've always loved that Away luggage has these 360 wheels. It has this like interior compression. It has a TSA combination lock, a laundry bag, and can really support you for a longer journey if you're looking at the large suitcase. So Away for all your travels. I'm excited for you to get on the road this year. I'm excited for you to see the world. Use Away as that support for you in your journey and exploring all that is in the world and still looking sexy and cool. So you can do your 100-day trial and shop the entire Away lineup of travel accessories. I love their duffel as well, including their best-selling suitcases at awaytravel.com slash almost 30. So try it all out. See if you love it. Feel good about it. Support the show at awaytravel.com slash almost 30 and enjoy. So I have to get real that I am someone that has cramps on my period. And if you are not a cramp girly, I am very jealous of your life. I don't know what it is, but I've always had these cramps during my period. And so it wasn't until I found Deloon, which has been incredibly helpful to support my period. It supported my hormones during the process. It supported a better mood. But I really, really have loved their Cramp Aid product. This is like a herbal nutritional relief for period cramps and discomfort, for like the bloating, the ickiness. It's like my go-to to feel better on my period. It's the drug-free way for an easy period. That's what I really love about it. This is drug-free, but it's a therapeutic dose of evidence-based ingredients in rapid-release capsules because we cannot wait, honey. So in a survey that Cramp Aid did, 93% reported relief with one hour of taking the dose. So whenever you're feeling off, whenever you're feeling crampy during your period, or if your girlfriend is, you have to take Cramp Aid from Deloon because you will feel so much better. It calms inflammation, it relaxes uterine muscles, it boosts oxygen flow with ingredients like vitamin B, zinc, ginger, donkey, marigold. It's powerful. They also have a product called Steady Mood, which is really good. If you're someone that suffers from hormonal mood issues, this is going to be really helpful for you. And they have a period rescue kit. The period rescue kit is for any woman that needs menstrual essentials for their natural cycle relief. It's like the bundled kit. It has Steady Mood, it has Cramp Aid. So it's both of those products in one, which is pretty freaking incredible. So I keep this on hand at my house for when my friends are over, for when I'm out. And I also have it for myself whenever I need because I don't want my period or anything like that to hold me back. With energy matching, I think that was some of the teachings. Energy matching and then channeling other people's energy Mm. is something, some of the teachings that I've really been changed by of your work because I was like, oh, wow. Is that my whole personality? (laughs) You know, like is... Because I think a lot of times in our culture and society, that is how you get validated. That is how existence is really safety when you're energy matching, Mm -hmm. whether it's for a cause or whether it's with your family or whether it's with your friends or whether it's with society. So I was like, wow, where am I energy matching and where am I loved because of my ability to energy match? Um, And so I've really been working on not doing that. But I guess my question is talking a little bit more about that because I want our audience to understand what that is and when that can be happening. Yeah. So, yeah, take it kind of back in time, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, a lot of us were just we were taught this in childhood, Mm -hmm. you know, right. And there's like this place where like psychology kind of drops off and then that's where like energy and like psychic work has to come in because, you know, psychology will kind of talk about people pleasing and, you know, um, like over over giving and over caretaking and like mm-hmm. the scapegoat in the family and you know the peacemaker and the nurturer mm-hmm. right and all that's true but how do we break that right mm-hmm. and and we can do a certain amount of work on the the level of mind right to like address our unconscious programs and mm-hmm. all of that but at some point what i have found is that we have to address what's happening in our energy field we have to address how we're running energy we have to address how we're running our chakras if we're running our second energy center hyper open mm-hmm. right and we're pulling other people's energy in that's like the empath curse mm-hmm. thing right so you you run your second energy center so open with and that's where the center of boundaries mm-hmm. are so there's no you're there's no boundaries between you and the other person so you're pulling their energy in to your energy field, right? Their problems, their drama, right? You're transmuting it for mm-hmm. them. They're not actually getting to work with their emotional energy. So yeah. it's not actually serving them other than some temporary relief in that moment of their distress. You take that in 
right? That's what a lot of us were taught to do in our childhood, to be the one to feel all of the emotions in the family that no one else was willing to feel or engage with or even acknowledge, right? And there's a lot of stories that come with that, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, my worth and my value is based on being the one to do the empath hug where I absorb Mm -hmm. everything other person's feeling, they leave feeling better, I leave feeling like crap, right? We have reinforced it as an identity Mm -hmm. When really at the end of the day, when you look at the mechanics of it, it's just like close down your second energy center, mm-hmm. you know, right? And then and then you're, you feel different. You're in relationship with other people. It's different, right? And you start to experience boundaries. You start to experience the feeling of you're having a great day. Someone else <sighs> is having a challenging day. You give yourself permission to still be in the energy that you're in. So you still, you're still present. You still create space for them to maybe process but you don't do their work for them. You don't take it on for them. You know, you what we always say is you observe and don't absorb, right? And in that way, like, it's skillful empathy, right? It's not mm. empathing to the point where you take it on. It's empathy, right? And it's done in a boundary way. So you still get to be in your own energy. And also what's really beautiful about that is that now when we know – a lot more now about the nervous system and polyvagal theory like we know that how we learn self-regulation is through co-regulation so if you actually can stay in a place where you're self-regulated right then they can attune right so they can mm. attune mm-hmm. to find their own like self-regulation where if you match their energy then you're both in distress and then you're both flailing mm-hmm. Right. So that's a very like I think it's a common example that a lot of people um, can relate to, Mm -hmm. understand like the mechanics of it based on what they already know about. um, Yeah. Just how they've how they've experienced like, quote unquote, holding space. Yeah. Which oftentimes what really holding space means is that we're using our own energy. Mm -hmm. Right. What's different is when we create space, we don't use our own energy. Right. We use Mm. universal energy. We use earth energy. We create a container for people to process things in we're not using our energy because okay. one when you do healing you're not supposed to use your own energy right it's like 101 mm-hmm. when you learn heal- energy healing right it's you're not using your own energy but that's what unfortunately a lot of people do is they match energy and then they use their own energy and they use their own body to mm. process other people's things and the, the interesting thing is that you actually can't process other people's stuff Right. You, you really can't. So when I train people in psychic development and energy healing, one of the first things we learn is, is this mind? Because most of us have been a psychic sponge our whole life. So when we're feeling something, we have to be able to go through and look and say, OK, I'm feeling anger. How much of this is mine? Right. How much of this is my parents? How much of this is the collective's? How much of this is mine, but it's from my past, from my childhood. It's coming up now because the current moment is reminding me of that. And I didn't have enough capacity in my nervous system to process all of what I was feeling in the past when I was younger. So it's coming up now, right? And then some of it is also past life, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? So we, we do all that so that we can come into the present moment and be with what's mine Mm -hmm. and what's in the present moment. When we do that, we're like, oh, there's actually not that much here to do. There's actually not that much Mm -hmm. work to do. When our aura is constantly clouded because it's full of like other people's thought forms or thought forms we've created and, you know, we don't have clarity to be able to actually see the situation clearly so again there's i've named a couple of like key kind of like foundational practices but like when things are coming up when you're doing a healing on yourself you know you want to get clear first and foremost and how we do that again is we ground we resource we clear what's not ours whatever is ready to be cleared right it's not it's not a one-time thing so you take a shower one time and then you never take a shower again, right? You're right. Con- you have to constantly continue to do energetic hygiene, right? We do have a backlog, right? So 
to a certain degree, we're kind of like working through that backlog. Okay, once we learn these this work, we're working through that backlog of all the things that we've absorbed, right? And we also are more skillful in the moment when we're like, wait a minute, why am I feeling so wonky? Well, okay, hold on a second. Whose energy is that? Oh, okay. My mom's energy just came in because dot, 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 dot. And you get to start to be able to actually identify like, Whose energy is that, right? That's when it kind of gets really cool mm -hmm. because you have your usual suspects, mm -hmm. right? Which yes. is like your parents. Mm -hmm. You tend to be enmeshed with your parents. You tend to be enmeshed with ex-partners. We can be in, we can be energetically enmeshed with um, people that we are angry with. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most common times that we enmesh and match energy. So other thing we do is we pull our energy back. Mm -hmm. So if we're in a situation where we're not happy with someone or even in love, right? Where let's say we're in love and we're completely like just enmeshed. I don't know where I start, where you end, right? So we, we want to get back into that clarity. We want to come home to ourselves. We want to process and say, okay, like this was feeling like it was good and it was feeling like it was going in a good direction. But then you realize, oh, actually, I was just matching that person's enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. I was matching their excitement. I'm actually maybe not as excited mm -hmm. about what this person is proposing, right? So that's to kind of loop it back. That's why you quote unquote don't match positive energy either because if it's not yours, it's not authentic. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, you want to find your authentic enthusiasm, your authentic, you know, energy. You want to be able to be like, I'm present in this relationship with both when I'm not happy and when I'm happy, I want it to be mine. Mm. And we can harmonize, right? We can harmonize. But that's different than I'm channeling your, like, your shore. And I'm like, I'm not quite that sure. But your energy is so big that I just absorb it. And this is how people get lost in a relationship. Because the other person is insisting. The other person is like, I'm so sure. I'm so clear. This is da 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 da. You're my twin flame mm -hmm. or whatever. You know, and then you kind of like get swept up in it. You didn't find your own energy in it all. And then they change their mind or whatever. And then you're completely like out to sea with what happened. Where am I? Well, you haven't been being your authentic self the whole way through. You've been matching energy with the other person. No wonder you feel lost. And then especially if you split, split apart, if they've been informing how you feel about everything, you're like, mm -hmm. what just happened? And a lot of people go through relationships like that their whole life. Mm -hmm. exactly. But I see that happen all the time and with I feel friends like our, and women. Like I feel like our relationship has been such a cool yeah. way to practice mm -hmm. this. Yes. Because in early mm -hmm. years, I feel like we were matching each other's energies. Right. Yeah. Right. And now oh, it's yeah. like a safe space also. Safe space. To um, <clears throat> but it to actually pause, decided by to, it. Yeah, to pause and be like, yeah. how do I feel? Yeah. And have it be okay sure. if it's not the same. Yeah. And we're still able to, yeah, just kind of observe each other's experience and kind of check in yeah. with our own experience. I mean, I've definitely had so many experiences where I have been running my creative energy, mm -hmm. right? Like getting all this like insight, information, like connecting to spirit and like that guiding and informing everything from like what music I'm listening to, to, you know, like where I'm drawn, who yeah. I'm drawn to. And then I've had so many experiences where I've had a best friend and we were always like, well, my favorite color is pink. So your favorite color is pink, <laughs> you know, and we think that that's safety. Mm -hmm. Right. And as we're navigating life and we're learning, we're like, Oh my God, we're so similar. Mm -hmm. We're almost the same. And you're like, how do we end up with the same haircut? And you look mm -hmm. back and you're like, we were one person. Mm -hmm. We were not whole. <laughs> we were, you know? And what I have found is that as I've gone through like and matured, I run a lot of creative energy. So I realize a lot of times, and you know, I have a big wound around this, of mm -hmm. that the things that we both were into were my things. Right? And I'm like, I say that, my things. Mm -hmm. But I never got to have like, I found this new musician and I'm really loving this. It always became our song. Mm. And I always thought, okay, what's the big deal? It's just a song or it's just a this or it's just a that. But now I understand what it's about. 
right? It's like, I want you to be yourself. I want to actually, like, meet you. I don't want you to just match my energy. That, as much as people think, like, I want to, I'm going to match that person's energy so that we can create safety. Mm -hmm. I actually don't feel safe when people match my energy. We all do it in these, like, little ways, right? You'll notice when I leave people, I will separate, Mm -hmm. right? I will send their energy back, you know, call my energy back. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm not necessarily, like, on a conscious level, like, how did that go? But, you know, in the background, I am tracking how did that feel? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm taking in information, like, Oh, that felt good. Like we were individuated and we didn't agree on everything. And there wasn't this conflict about Mm. it. Right. Like you got to be yourself. I could be myself, you know, and that for me actually feels like safety because I know that you're you. Mm -hmm. You're not looking for someone to kind of like put you on. You're not looking to tap into someone else's creative energy. You have your own connection to source. I have my own connection and we get to like see where we match, see where Mm -hmm. we like naturally harmonize and not because you're trying on my energy Mm -hmm. and you're trying to find yourself. So it's again, it's really subtle, Mm -hmm. but I've noticed that even in people that will start to talk like me and, Mm -hmm. you know, and I'm I'm a wordsmith, so I'm always like making up words and like coming up with little ways of saying things. And I'll notice that, again, it becomes like, oh, that's how we talk about things. That's our reference point. That's like Mm. our thing. So I'm really, um, I'm more aware that that happens. I'm more aware that it's not coming from a bad place. You know, it's not like, oh, my gosh, like that person's doing something wrong to me. But I do feel that it's important now where I'm at to sort of recognize when that happens. And I will make sure that my second energy center is like closed down. And thankfully I have a lot of people in my life right now where I can talk about energetic things with them. I can talk about subtle things. I can say, you know, I noticed da 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 da. And they are thankful, Mm. you know, they respect my, um, you know, my perspective, they respect my reads on things. They want that feedback. They want to know like, oh my gosh, I want to know if I'm doing something with my energy that I'm not aware of. Like there's, that's a valuable love language for a lot of people. And when I have new people that come into my life, I can evaluate how deep we can go Mm -hmm. on how like willing they are to receive that kind of feedback and not just receive it, but actually like do something with it. And because I can offer tools and techniques I can say, you know, I remember when I used to dot, 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 and this is what really helped me, and I think you would really benefit from this practice, and then they love it, you know? So I get to be in my medicine, you know, and in my dharma, um, and share that with people, share what's helped me find my authenticity, and ultimately, like, the thing I always say to people is, if anything, I want to be, like, a permission slip for you to be your authentic self, Mm -hmm. you know, and that will mean at times that we need space. That's part of it, you know. You want to talk about that too was um, Mm -hmm. the space, like the sacred pause or just that like intentional pause within relationships and friendships Mm -hmm. and how you can do that because I think for a lot of the women in our community, it doesn't feel okay. It doesn't feel safe to take a pause. I've had to work through a lot of my attachment with women and my relationships Mm -hmm. with women. Now I feel really good, but it's like I had to take a while to learn to trust, to learn to trust Mm -hmm. they wouldn't abandon me, Mm -hmm. all of those things. So it would have been scary for me a while ago to be able to do that, but now I am. But I'd love to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think just kind of acknowledging that, one, you know, I would hope that at this point in my life that the people that I'm invested in, the people that I'm in relationship with, like that we have a lot of shared values and that we are all still learning you know and that like I'm not necessarily like the expert on everything right I don't see and know all things I have a skill set because this is what I you know dedicate my my work to doing and to learning about and I love it I have a natural gift for um being sensitive to energy and being able to like learn psychic things really quickly so first one acknowledging that For me, I would say that the people that are in my life are, you know, doing the best that they know how to with the skills that they have and that they're on a spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. I would say 
I trust the people that are in my life that I desire to be intimate with are on a spiritual path. So there's already like a foundational understanding of certain things. So I'm, I'm going to just put that out there, right? Um, if I was to find that that was not the case, for me, just because of the nature of my path and the nature of like how catalyzing I am, I probably would hesitate to get close to someone um, if I saw that they were perhaps like, you know, surface level kind of spiritual work, right? Yeah. Um, just because they're going to, I'm going to trigger the hell out of them. <laughs> like mm -hmm. yeah. Left and right, like just by <laughs> existing. Um, so all that being said, you know, I do feel that one of the things that I um, bring to the table is communication. Um, and I'm always looking for ways to be able to communicate better, practicing ways to be able to see, um, you know, if I, if I have a difficult conversation I need to have with someone to really be able to tend to my system in a way where I can say, you know, can, I, can we take a pause? there's a lot coming up for me. I'm starting to really feel distressed. I'm, I'm noticing my heart shutting down. You know, these are all things I can name in a difficult conversation. I can say, should we take a step back and come back to this? Should we, there was a lot, that, that was a lot. Should we just process that? So I can still care about someone else's well-being more than just, I need to get my point across. Mm -hmm. So if someone if someone is not doing well, I'm always open to how did how was that received? How did that land? You know, so that's that's one thing I I'll always work on is even if I feel completely justified in the thing that I want to say, even if I feel really clear on what I want, what I either experienced, what I need to articulate to someone, what I didn't like how it's received mm -hmm. is still really important to me because if it's not ultimately beneficial for the greatest good, then we can forget about it. And what that looks mm -hmm. like is that I will take the amount of space that I need to love you at the distance that feels yeah. right, that mm -hmm. feels safe for where you're at, safe for where I'm at. That's not a punishment. I don't do retaliation. I don't do punishment energy even if that's what I'm getting. That's my agreement to myself. Mm -hmm. That's my agreement to break the cycle, you know, of harm. And even if I'm getting like, you're an awful person, you're, whatever I'm getting, I'm always going to make that commitment to what are my values regardless of what anyone else are doing. And one of my values is honoring truth. You know, it's also kindness. You know, so there's certain things that I come back to and I can, I'll notice not because someone had to hold me accountable or, but I'll say, yeah, I was, I lost my connection with my kindness mm -hmm. and I can feel that because I felt my heart shut down and I should have stepped back, right? Like I will own that because that's the work that I'm committed to doing on myself. Again, I'm not saying I'm perfect at it, but I think the people that are in relationship with me, when they know those are my values, they know that they can kind of come back and say, I totally hear you, but I did not feel comfortable with how that was delivered. I did not feel, you know, dot, dot, dot. So mm -hmm. we can nuance in that way. You know, we can talk about safety. I can even say, do you think we should bring in someone else, a neutral third party to have this conversation? Because again, Ultimately, for me, I'm about solutions. You know, I'm about how do we how do we rebuild this? Do we want to rebuild this? What would rebuilding it look like? How do we repair mm. the trust that was broken? <laughs> how do we both learn? And one thing I've really accepted is that I used to do this thing where when I could tell that someone's like feedback to me or criticisms of me were more about them needing to get one in, like more about them needing to la lash out, more about like, let's say, maybe I brought some things to them that I wanted to bring to their attention that I thought were like unskillful or something that I experienced, um, a boundary felt crossed or something. There is this 
kind of thing of like, well, you did this mm-hmm. other thing, right? So I I used to sort of just ignore that. But I've actually learned that even if the thing they're saying isn't necessarily valid, there's still something there for me. Mm-hmm. There's still something there for me in being able to work with what's coming up with me. Mm. And the more that I can kind of be neutral, the more that I cannot get hooked. There's not that Velcro, right? I'm not matching their energy. That allows me to see, are those reactive tendencies still in me? And it's training. You know, I would say it's ninja training. Yeah. So... In general, I feel that the people that I'm in relationship with now know that they can give me feedback. They know that I'm going to sit with that feedback. Again, now. I say that now. Mm -hmm. Um, And they know that at the end of the day that my value is to genuinely allow people to be where they are and to never try to change anyone into who I need them to be to be more comfortable My hope is that if anything, all I'm doing is seeing where you are out of alignment and out of integrity with yourself and showing you a mirror to say, is that how you wanted to show up? Does that feel right to you? That's what I experienced. You know, is that where you truly at? And some people will say, yeah, that's really where I'm at. And that's when the space conversation comes in. That's Mm -hmm. when it's like, if, if you need to be exploring that, Um, type of behavior or that way of being or that type of coping strategy or that way of getting your needs met, you know, acting out as a way to get your needs met. If that's truly where you are, I honor that, but I can't participate. Sure. Mm -hmm. So then that becomes a thing of like, again, I'm not going to try to change you. I will remove myself. And that's where the power lies. The power lies in being able to say, this doesn't work for me. You have full permission to be there. I can't go there with you. So that looks like me taking a step back. So again, all that to say, um, and people have full permission to, and I encourage people to take space for me. You know, I say, should, let's take space. What do you think? Should we take space? You know, let's. that was a lot. Let's process. You know, and what does, I think outlining what the space taking looks like Mm -hmm. is also really important, Mm -hmm. you know? So, okay, so let's talk about this. Does it mean that we should reach out ever so often just to check in and see where we're at? Would you like me to reach out to you? Um, You know, what does the space taking look like? How long should we go or should we just see how we feel? Should it be more like when you're inspired to reach out? So really outlining it because, one, I acknowledge people have abandonment issues. I acknowledge we all have different attachment styles. So checking in to be able to um, understand, you know, when we need to have a difficult conversation, how can we do that in a way that feels safe to you? How can we do that in a way that feels productive? It doesn't need to be the same thing for me, but how can we try to find a middle ground where your needs are acknowledged, my needs are acknowledged, we acknowledge it's going to be uncomfortable, and we both can commit to like moving towards a solution. So if if that is the case for me, I'm pretty much always happy to do the work. Mm-hmm. You know, if someone can meet me at that level, mm-hmm. I'm pretty much always happy to do the work because what's going to come out is going to be invaluable. The space makes me think about how we've in some ways lost the plot on like the, the natural way things want to move. So yeah. <clears throat> I was thinking about soil because I'm like, if mm. we plant in soil over and over and over and over again, it's going to be depleted over time. Mm. It needs kind of that rest period. Mm. And I think in relationships, like Krista was saying, like we just, we think it's bad. We think it's unnatural. Like mm. we can't take a break. That mean, What does that mean for us? What does that mean about me? And so I just love this conversation because it's really just bringing that normalcy back to, yeah, we can we can take time away. I mean, even taking space from my husband is like so healthy mm-hmm. for, for us when we like if I'm traveling and we yeah. just kind of we don't really communicate too, too much. Sure. And it just feels like a mini like rejuvenation yeah. of the soil, you yeah. know. So I just I love that we're talking about it with friendships because 
especially with women, I feel like there's that codependency of like, yeah, are you mad at me? Is everything okay? Is it, you know? Yeah, it- and I feel like an important thing to also name here is, again, because we use this terminology, sometimes you're taking space, but you're in the same room. Yes. You know, and so when I say taking space, what I'm talking about is pulling my energy back. I have a teenager and we'll have a conversation and maybe he'd be a heated conversation and I'll immediately, you know, I'll just go into my room, but I'll immediately notice mm. my energy is still in his room. It's still like, you need to do this thing. <laughs> so it's pushing up against him. That's not going to make him want to do the thing. So when I say taking space, what I'm actually really talking about is pull your energy back out of their space you know let them find themselves in that and that and from that place right then they they can move in a way that's authentic not because you're coaxing you're prodding you're pushing you're using your energy in a way that's invasive so you can take space where you don't talk and you do all that and like move away physically but if you don't pull your energy back, it's not going to feel like that. You have to recognize that like all of our energies are different, right? Like I have a really big energy. So what I found is for a lot of times with people that maybe their energy isn't so big that but my energy can feel like a lot. Mm -hmm. So I've really had, you know, and not in a way where I'm shrinking, but I really have to be mindful Mm -hmm. of other people's, like letting people have Mm -hmm. space because Otherwise, it's like I took over the whole room. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> sure. You know, so I've had to, you know, teach myself like, oh, I have a really big energy. Mm-hmm. And when I'm mad, people feel it. When I'm happy, people feel it. When I, you know, I can really like tune the whole room. So I have to be like really mindful of like, where am I at? Okay, I'm all over the place. Come, come on back. Give other people space to breathe. Um, and that I think is a really important skill set for all of us to learn. Mm -hmm. But especially if you're someone that has like, you have a big energy, it's really, we really have to learn that. Mm -hmm. Completely. With running, um, the different energy centers, Mm -hmm. you know, thinking about the heart, is the heart an energy center that you can have open all the time? Because, you know, there is languaging in the collective around that where it's like keep an open heart all of that but is it safe to have your heart open all the time <sighs> that's such a great question so you know i'm a part of a, a lot of different spiritual traditions and lineages and one thing i'm really interested in is how different systems run their energy differently so i was born and raised sufi and i'm part of a sufi lineage and sufism is all about the heart it's all about cultivation of the heart everything is the heart is the center of all the things, right? But I'm also trained by like psychic teachers. So, you know, for a lot of my teachers that run um, their energy different, you know, you see the world through your third eye. I think honestly, it's really a personal preference. I think in general, how we run our chakras is a personal preference and it's about personal skill and it's about what's appropriate in this situation. I example I always use, don't really need your heart to be fully open in the DMV. Right? You probably want your, you know, your mind's eye open. You want to be able to like peep what's going on. Some people really hyper open their third energy center and that and they're like, look at how powerful I am. Mm-hmm. Some people, you know, run their second energy center like really open. I think the more we calibrate the different levels for ourselves and notice like this is actually in this moment like it feels good to have my heart open you know and to not to guard the heart right we want to be mindful of guarding but calibrating the heart right kind of being like okay it's going to be at 70 percent in this conversation Mm -hmm. because otherwise I might go into some unskillful um, ways of engaging. You know, if I'm running too much heart and not enough clairvoyance, you know, I might not actually be as skillful as I could be. So it's tracking what is appropriate in that moment for that situation, right? And I always say, you know, run your diagnostics um, and see, you know, what and, and play with it, play with you know, so when you go into like um, a reading state or a channeling state, there are some people who 
read from the second energy center, mm-hmm. right? I personally don't recommend it um, because you end up pulling a lot mm-hmm. of things in. But it is a way to be able to feel, oh, that's what they're feeling, right? Mm-hmm. So you're reading some, you're reading the room through your mm-hmm. second, right? I do like reading through my heart in certain situations, um, but I know how to switch it up. You know, I know how to switch it up and to bring my awareness in the center of my head and be looking at things clairvoyantly Mm -hmm. and to not be feeling what the other person's feeling, to not necessarily be like in the heart about it, but to be like in a neutral, you know, state of mind and just observing and perceiving things that way. I think people can become too, also too dominant in their Mm -hmm. their higher centers and disconnected from their heart Mm -hmm. one of the main messages that i got for when i was channeling for the collective for this year it is encouraging people to get back in their heart and things can get imbalanced right but i feel like the more people are kind of like how do you open your third eye Mm -hmm. how do you you know um astral project how do you channel you know Mm -hmm. how do you bring things in your crown and how do you telepathically like you know receive information i think you know, we have moved out of the heart, um, you know, and so people that have a lot of heart capacity, I think are being asked to come back into their heart. And I know for me, what that looked like was, it wasn't that I wasn't like running enough heart energy out, is that I wasn't take bringing enough in. So that's the mm. back of the chakras. I wasn't allowing enough to come in. So I had to work on my receptivity with bringing more um, energy into the heart so that I wasn't depleting my heart chi. Mm-hmm. That's a very real thing, right? Mm-hmm. Like in Chinese medicine, like, you know, you can, they'll, they'll say like the heart chi is depleted. Mm-hmm. But before it gets to that point, you can sort of feel um, that you're sending out more nourishment, right? You're sending out and you're it's not balanced and matching what is coming in. So I think it's not just, is it open? Mm-hmm. Right, because there's the the front can be open and the back can be closed. You can run more energy through the heart, but you have to be like an instrument, mm-hmm. you know, for that to be skillful and not just you're constantly pouring in and depleting your heart energy. You have to be open to receive in order to do that. Otherwise, it is appropriate to kind of like, mm-hmm. you know, close your heart down mm-hmm. some and say, I need some of my own love mm-hmm. right now. Yeah, I think with all of it, it's again going even deeper into the energetics. It's like if your heart is just open in the front but not in the back, what is the energetics behind why that is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You think you have to give more than Mm -hmm. you're able to receive. You feel like you have to give to be seen or loved or saved Mm -hmm. and in all that situation. And and also with the friends taking the time away from a friendship, what is the energetic behind, you know, you being feeling scared to do it? Mm -hmm. It's like if you Mm -hmm. feel clear – Sure. I feel safe even if we aren't friends, even if sure. we lose this, even if we move on. Because if you're going into it like I'm scared to do this because I'm scared I'm mm-hmm. going to be abandoned or I'm bad mm-hmm. or all of those things. It's like reading it that way. But yeah, the heart one's such an interesting one because I'm not, you know, my goal is to be more in the heart because I feel like that for me feels like it helps me really get clear on if it's ego led mm-hmm. or if it is true for me sure you know because a lot of times when we are in the crown and the third eye it is sort of like okay I want to get these skills to like be seen as this or use it for this or be in practice with this because it'll help me get to here rather than like the heart is so present Mm -hmm. it's like so nice Mm -hmm. and I feel like when because I can tell very clearly when my heart's closed or open and front and back if I try to open it Mm -hmm. it's like not it's not the way it's Mm -hmm, like almost mm -hmm. like being where I'm at because I'm definitely someone who's aware of how my mood or energy affects people and I try to kind of like flip it just so they're okay (laughs) you know what I mean but it's actually being in that and actually owning it a bit more as to like why Mm -hmm. I'm kind of feeling like I need to close the back of my heart right now Mm -hmm. or close the front of my heart right now or just be in that and it almost for me it softens it a little bit because I'm actually honoring how I'm feeling. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's the first thing of it all, mm-hmm, you know, is yeah. to kind of be like, where am I at with it? Yeah. Right. And what do I need? You know, and, and tracking it, yeah. you know, um, and not judging it and not making it bad or wrong, but being curious about it. And mm-hmm. say, oh, that's interesting. 
notice my heart shut down, right? A lot of times when I'm tracking my energy around people, it's telling me things that I wasn't necessarily picking up on. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, oh, that's so interesting. Why did I just feel that? And oftentimes I'll notice that the other person is sending energy at me in a way that is manipulative. Mm -hmm. And it's subtle. What's you know? an example? Um, like, <laughs> like people want things from us. A hundred percent. You know, they want you to validate them. Yes. They want you to see them. They mm -hmm. want you to meet some need, right? So even when I say manipulative, I say that in a like a lighthearted mm -hmm. way, right? But people are tinkering with you to try to get an effect out of you. So right, when we were talking about the heart earlier, one thing I want to say is like one thing that people will do is that people will show you their pain pictures, right? This is psychic, mm -hmm. subtle, it's on a subtle level. Mm -hmm. They'll show you, they don't even have to say a word, they'll <sighs> show you a psychic picture of like, I'm in pain. And what, what happens is we start running love to them. We start mm -hmm. nourishing them. We start feeding them, right? And it's not as if that's inherently bad or wrong, but what it is, it's unconscious. Right. And I want to be aware of if, if I'm in relationship with someone and they're kind of tapping into me for my energy and less about how do we nourish each other. Like, I want to know that. Right. So I might notice kind of like, oh, why is my heart kind of like starting to like close down a little bit? And it's like, oh, well, because that person is like depleting that the way that you all are relating right now. You know, you weren't tracking it, but your heart is letting you know that this could start to get draining, mm -hmm. right? And so you you would put certain boundaries in place. You would see, it maybe not be it might not be time to have a conversation yet because it's so subtle, but you'd put certain boundaries in place and you would see how they respond, right? If they start acting out and start doing things to try to get you, then you say this is how they cope, this is how they mm -hmm. relate. This is how they get their needs met. And again, that determines like how much time I spend with them, how aware people are of what they're doing. If someone says, I need love right now, like, cool. You're aware. Mm -hmm. I'm aware. It's mm -hmm. consensual. Mm -hmm. It's conscious. We're talking about it. I'm in agreement. We're in right relationship. But when it's done kind of like behind my back and it's like triggering my nurturing it's triggering my mothering you know and i have to be the one to manage that you know that's not that fun mm -hmm. so for me it's it's really not about one chakra is like the one for me being in my power is being in all of my energy centers a lot of people tend to be really top heavy and they're not present in their lower the lower, the lower dantian so for me i had to really learn to get in my feet you know, and I had to really learn, like, I actually love nurturing people. You know, like, I love caring for people. I love, but I love when it's consensual. Yeah. I love when it's acknowledged. I love when there's an understanding of energy exchange. And I love doing it when I'm resourced, yes. you know. And when I'm not in my feet, that means I'm not pulling energy from the earth. I'm using my energy and I don't love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But if I'm being an yes. instrument and I'm being a channel, right? And I'm like bringing in the mm -hmm. energies, like the etheric energies, the universal energies, I'm bringing energies in and I'm making energies available. And then I'm teaching you how to bring those energies in for yourself. You how to generate love, right? Like, because then you're going to, you're going to be able to like really calibrate it to like, Okay, what's the specific kind of love frequency that I need right now? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times what's, what happens, and this is, a, a, again, a really kind of a little bit more of an advanced concept, but this is really like some of the work that my teachers do that they really specialize in, is talking about inappropriate nurturing, right? Mm -hmm. I used to call it unhealthy helping, but my teachers talk a lot about how when people are showing us their pain or showing us their suffering we often try to give them more nurturing than they are available to receive. Because again, they might have mm. their chakras closed off to actually be able to receive the, not receive the thing they're asking for. So 
that is again a draining experience like you're asking for nurturing on a psychic level but you're not open to receive it so there's that and then we also often give the wrong kind of nurturing we might give a nurturing that says oh you're not capable again these are getting into really subtle things but when we do this work skillfully we are aware of what's the request we're aware of not running nurturing through their potential but it's actually attuned to where they are it's not our own energy we're being the channel right and i do this in group energy healing so um i tune into the group i talk about what's happening i say notice this notice that notice what's happening in here i'm getting a lot of messages about like this and that tune into that And then you bring up energy from the earth. You ask the earth to validate you. You ask the earth to nourish you. You ask your vaster self to bring in the perfect frequency of energy that you need in this moment. And then what happens is that's such a game changer because that's available for us no matter what anyone else is willing to do for us. When we realize that we can be in relationship with energy that's healing, that's coming from ourselves, our soul, and the earth, and the cosmos, and we can bring that energy in at any time, we learn how to charge up our own battery. And to me, that's a more valuable thing that I can offer people than to send them some, just, mm. I'm gonna send you some nur- nourishment right now to be able to say, I'm gonna take you to the well, And I'm going to teach you how to get there again on your own so that you don't need me and you don't need someone else Mm -hmm. to do it in that way. So it's not that we don't still have nurturing amongst each other. It's just that our primary source of nourishment isn't other people. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's really like, that's when relationships transform. That's when relationships get Mm -hmm. fun. That's where we're going. Totally. You know, we're not, we're stepping out of this parent paradigm of everyone being chronically energetically depleted mm-hmm. and i'm not talking about low energy I'm not talking about low vibes I'm talking about depleted like we don't actually have any juice mm-hmm. so how do we get our energy charged up how do we charge our battery mm-hmm. and instead of plugging into other another mm-hmm. battery plugging into the source mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been thinking about that lately. I'm like, okay, if I have such a great relationship with God and the creator, like where am I trying to be, still be God? Mm. And that means like, where am I no, where am I not surrendering to my life? And where am I feeling like I'm fully responsible for the direction of my life? I'm fully responsible mm. for all these things. It's like sometimes my energy can be running in that way where I still think that I'm the one in charge. And I still think that I'm the one that's creating and doing everything that's like existing. And how can I just continue to come back to God and the creator as the person that's like actually running the show Mm -hmm. and sort of step out? Because I think a lot of times we as humans think that we're just, we have to do the work. We have to do everything. We have to create our life. And we're not really giving it up to God or surrendering it to God as much as we can. Yeah, I I love this like this question. I was talking to my teenager about this. <laughs> I would we, love to be your we teenager. Talk about, <laughs> you know, we talk about I was talking to him about like determinism and um free will and destiny and like how all these things play into each other and you know, one thing I always think about um in terms of like you know, what humanity is up to right now is that we really are learning about like what truly is surrender, mm-hmm. right? Like what does it really mean to surrender? When I say I surrender, does that mean I don't have a preference, mm-hmm. right? Does like what are those things that are informing, you know, what's possible and what's available for me? And for me, the way that I kind of work with kind of like guiding my life or directing my life is that I acknowledge my preferences. I acknowledge my preferences. I acknowledge that I have things that I would I would want to see happen, that I would like to see happen. You know, if this could work out, that'd be wonderful. If that could work out, that'd be wonderful. But I also get to a point where I say, you know, where I, I make my wishes known, right? But then I also let them go. When I create things, I pull my energy out of them, mm. right? Because I say, like, there is more than I can imagine 
available. And if I'm starting, you know, directing, like trying to manifest everything through what I think is possible or what I know, or even, you know, a lot of people try to get around this by saying, you know, um, don't focus on what it looks like, focus on how it feels. Well, there's feeling states that we don't even know are possible, Mm -hmm. right? The world is so vast in what's available and there's there's it's becoming even more and more expanded in things that like i never even knew i could feel like that like i never knew that was a possibility so we do our best i think with sort of guiding things based on our preferences and where we're at because i know that i'm still in a place where i still have i my identity still has preferences Mm -hmm. right and biases about things Mm -hmm. like you know i'm like i want to live on an island i really feel like i could see myself truly benefiting from island life right (laughs) like i have that as a preference i I love being in the sun where would you be you know i'm i'm still figuring it out i'm still asking Mm -hmm. the earth to show me like where where can i be Mm -hmm. you know um and that's a fun game to be called to places Mm -hmm. and to try to see what's available so i'm putting it out there that i have a preference but then from there I surrender, you know, I surrender like how it's going to happen, when it's going to happen, what it has to look like. But I think it's like it's one of these it's one of those both and things, you know, where I do think it's beautiful to wish. I do think it's beautiful to imagine. I do think it's beautiful to um, let our our wishes be known. What I do think is really important is to clear out the societal Mm -hmm. like stuff from it. One thing I always do when I say when I feel like I want something, I ask who in me wants this? Mm-hmm. Because I have nine siblings well. and I grew up, I didn't have a lot of my own things. I had to share everything. And I remember there were just all these moments where I just wanted stuff. You know, I wanted like a certain birthday cake or I wanted a certain backpack or I want. I just wanted stuff that I didn't have. So I always joke around now with, things as an adult and I say oh this is for the, my inner child that wanted that My Little Pony this is like the mm-hmm. the adult My Little Pony <laughs> that I wanted that I, I couldn't have yes. and I realize that I'm satisfying a younger version of myself I realize that I'm satisfying you know an unintegrated part of myself that is still operating on that timeline of like this isn't fair right so I'm, I'm nurturing that right like mm-hmm. I'm still there but at the same time, what happens a lot of times is I then get the thing and I'm like, and now what? Mm-hmm. So we still have to do the energy work. You know, we still have to do mm-hmm. the work. I think if we go into things consciously and we make it playful and we acknowledge that, you know, we can do a healing on give by giving ourselves things. We can do a healing by allowing ourselves to receive things, to say, you know, this is for that younger part of me. That feeling of like, I want something and I can give it to myself like that satisfies something in me emotionally. I don't want to stay there. I don't want that to dictate my whole life. I don't want my inner child to pick my partner. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. I let it have some room to, to, to play, you know, in a harmless way. But I don't let it run my life. I don't let it drive the boat, you know, so um Our desires, our wants, our wishes can be coming from all types of places. Sometimes there's a part of me that I know is an unintegrated part of me that is acting out, right? And it wants something. And I'll say, like, who in me wants this? I'm like, okay, this is my inner 16-year-old, my rebellious inner 16-year-old that really wants this thing. I could go about this a lot of different ways. I could adult parent that part of me I could talk to that part of me I could da 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 or I could go into it consciously and watch myself I can watch what comes up I can watch what happens to me it's all about awareness you know it is discipline too because again that that goes up to a certain point but I think when we're trying to learn about ourselves and learn about our unmet needs and start to like give ourselves that I do think it's okay to um to want and to wish and to desire and then from that place to say okay and now (laughs) what does like the greater 
the universe have mm-hmm. available for me. And because you have taken care of that need, yeah, need. I feel like it's mm-hmm. easier to go ahead and surrender. Yes. You don't feel like you're in a, like asceticism. Mm. You know, like I, I don't, that, I'm not an aesthetic. Like I'm not a renunciate, you know, mm-hmm. I'm not, I don't renounce the material world. And if that's people's path, that's great. But that's not my path. It's not how I see it. I really love beautiful things. I love beauty. I love adornment. Mm-hmm. And I I love like adorning my energy field in with clothes and makeup and jewelry and all the things that I feel like contribute to my energy field. Yes. So I love playing with things, with physical objects in a way to create a mood, you know, to create a field. Um, and I love traveling and collecting things as well. Mm. And I've, I feel like I've been drawn to places. I've found sacred objects. Um, I've had that experience many times where I've picked something up and I could feel the energy of it, you know, and I'm like, do I need this? No, I don't need this, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but it's still part of that. Uh, for me, it's still part of that game of like learning myself. Thank you so much, Miriam. Again, MiriamHasna.com. She is an intuitive channel energy healer and a lover of all things that create a feeling of being connected to something bigger. She is the creator of New Earth Mystery School and Resonance Apothecary. Stay tuned for part two coming out this Thursday. And if you loved this episode and would like to start conversations with friends or family members about what we talked about today, please send it to them. That supports us, but also just provides a really cool catalyst for conversation. We'll see you on the next one.